Okay. Uh, so we're going to discuss uh, the contract standards and in general how coins or tokens or are implemented in uh, Ethereum. So the basic uh, concepts of that. I believe you have already started uh, doing your lab and you are already familiarizing yourself with uh, the concepts. So uh, tokens, coins, these terms are used nearly, nearly interchangeably uh, in Ethereum. The idea behind Ethereum when it was invented in 2013-15 and then went live in 15, uh, was precisely not just to allow arbitrary smart contracts, but really to allow smart contracts which would easily implement other objects uh, which are substitutes for some value uh, on top of Ethereum. So basically, uh, we already know that the Ethereum network, uh, the Ethereum blockchain, uh, without any extra tokens, suppose that there are none, uh, how many currencies are running in uh, the Ethereum itself, so embedded in the Ethereum, intrinsic to Ethereum? Two. Two, precisely, which two? Uh, gas, Notion, and the Ethereum itself. Indeed, so don't forget about gas. So we have gas and Ethereum. And these are predefined currencies uh, in the Ethereum uh, blockchain. Uh, what does it mean uh, they are predefined? You know that in Ethereum there are two types of accounts. Uh, there are user accounts, well, three types actually, uh, user accounts, uh, smart contract accounts, user accounts, and therefore addresses with those accounts, all right? Uh, smart contract, let's say addresses, and there is a special type which, uh, well, let's call them really special addresses. Unlike Bitcoin, user accounts and addresses and wallets do really exist in Ethereum. If you remember in Bitcoin, there is actually no such a thing as a user address or user wallet. Uh, any user can assemble any type of transaction if they can get hold of uh, the funds used as input to this transaction. So there are multiple transactions around. And if you, for example, possess uh, the private keys corresponding to uh, the public keys or destinations of those previous transactions, then you can build another transaction using those destinations as your sources. So uh, addressing happens in uh, Bitcoin at the level of, uh, at the level of uh, transactions only, and any user wallets are just short party artifacts. You can use whatever uh, software which monitors uh, the Bitcoin blockchain and uh, it knows which private keys uh, you have and uh, associates the corresponding transaction outputs with the keys you have. And that is a kind of virtual wallet which uh, is yours in Bitcoin, all right? But in Ethereum, it is not the case. In Ethereum, you really have your, uh, as a physical personal user, you have your wallet address 
and uh, there is an embedded functionality in the Ethereum network, uh, which is about uh, making transactions uh, between those addresses. So you can send funds uh, to uh, any other user address, and this is a standard uh, type of, uh, the most simple uh, type of transaction within Ethereum. Uh, in addition, if you deploy a smart contract, and now you know, and uh, you already knew for quite a while, what do you do in order to deploy a smart contract in Ethereum? You create it, you compile it into a bytecode suitable for running on the Ethereum virtual machine. Then what do we do next in order to deploy it? How it gets deployed? You send all this data to a special address. If you remember which one? Zero. Zero, yes, indeed. So you send it to zero for smart contracts deployment. Okay. Uh, what else can you do? Uh, so when uh, you get a smart contract sent to zero address, it gets deployed and it automatically receives a valid address, uh, which is now associated with this smart contract. And now if you send transactions to uh, the smart contract address, then uh, you can do what? So first of all, can you send uh, simply Ethereum to a smart contract address in the same way, uh, in a similar way, how you send them between personal user accounts? So if you send Ethereum to a smart contract address, what will happen? Uh, actually, it will be rejected. If uh, it is not, if it is not defined as a special function in smart contract, which uh, allows to get the Ethereum. But normally, a smart contract uh, is constructed in such a way that uh, transactions to the smart contract address uh, are allowed. So normally, it is in general a correct operation to send funds to uh, an existing smart contract uh, address. I mean, to send to you. So that's completely normal. Uh, what you do uh, if you do it uh, other way around, for example, you send uh, funds to zero address, then obviously all bets are off and your funds are dead, all right? And there is a number of other burnout addresses uh, which uh, simply allow you to disperse, uh, dispense of your funds uh, if uh, they're sent to those addresses. But generally, uh, Ethereum transactions destined to smart contract addresses may very well be uh, a valid part of uh, functionality. So that's why this addressing mechanism, uh, which uh, uses uh, Ethereum balances associated with various addresses, both actually uh, user address and possibly a, a smart contract address. It is a normal part of uh, normal part of uh, Ethereum functionality, actually. And then uh, there is a way of how you create multiple myriads of other coins on top of Ethereum. So basically, those coins are other smart contracts. So on top of gas and Ethereum, then we have other coins or tokens. From the economic standpoint, and there are really many ways of how they can be designed, viewed, used uh, what is the purpose of them but uh, i think it is important 
to distinguish between uh, several classes of them. So first of all, there is a slight, uh, well, normally not slight, but in practice slight difference between uh, the so-called uh, utility uh, utility uh, coins or tokens. Which term do you prefer? Normally it is called token, but so many of them are implemented on top of Ethereum and they are coined, uh, called coin, then we also call them coins. Versus equity. Let's say coins. That's an interesting thing. Let us think in more detail about this. So, um, what is a utility token? Uh, the whole term token, it came from uh, just physical tokens, which you could use for uh, whatever purposes. So, for example, uh, I don't know, to, to uh, use a public uh, washing machine, so popular, let's say, in, in the US and uh, in the UK, or uh, a coin which uh, is used just in order to uh, <clears throat> get uh, entrance to, uh, let's say, an underground or something like that. Uh, so in this case, uh, those tokens or coins are used to pay for some utility. And that's why they are called utility uh, utility tokens. Uh, so basically you use this coin in order to receive some service. And a similar way of how those crypto tokens in Ethereum done, uh, basically you can... Uh, buy them, receive them, and then use them in order to pay for some kind of service, utility or service. And what is equity? Equity is an asset class, as we know in finance, uh, which uh, is also called stocks or shares or shares. So this is basically the stock market. And in a similar way, equity coins, if created and distributed, they allow the holders of those uh, equity coins to uh, use them as a kind of stocks or shares similar to the stock market. So let's see what is it. So what is similar to stock market? If we own a stock, a share of a company, it is not like a utility, right? So we're not using a share in order to pay for uh, whatever services, normally not. We use money to pay for services. Shares are something different. If we own a share, we do not use it directly as a payment instrument. We can sell it eventually for money or for uh, any other financial instruments. And after having sold it, yes, we can use it as, uh, we can use the proceeds of sale, we can use the money uh, obtained as a result. Uh, paying for services. But a share itself has two functions. So first of all, it indicates that uh, you have some kind of partial ownership of an enterprise. All right. So that's precisely the purpose why shares are created. partial ownership of a company. And because you are in part own the company, you may or may not, usually not, 
uh, but still uh, other possibilities also exist. Be allowed to, uh, for example, vote uh, as a stakeholder for some decisions. For example, there is a general meeting of the stakeholders and uh, a new CEO of the company is being elected. So your shares can be used for voting. Normally, uh, equity coins uh, distributed uh, through uh, blockchain systems are equivalent to non-voting shares, but not always. So we would say sometimes voting as a shareholder. Okay. And obviously, if you own a share, you may be entitled to receive dividends from the revenue, uh, the profit of the company. So these are functions of equity coins. Uh, from this point of view, Ethereum itself is obviously more close to a utility coin rather than to equity coin because Ethereum, uh, if you possess Ethereum, it doesn't indicate that you uh, have any rights or entitlements uh, to own a uh, part of a company, vote or receive dividends. Ethereum is only an instrument of making payments, including transborder payments, to uh, use it as a storage of value, uh, to uh, use it as, let's say, a financial trading instrument. But there is nothing like uh, equity in this case. So from the point of view of uh, financial asset classes, utility coins are similar really to coins, currencies, And equity coins, yes, similar to equity. And they may be so much similar to equity that actually issuing equity coins may require permissions approvals from uh, the corresponding a regulator in a particular jurisdiction. So you probably know, have you heard the story? Uh, what, for example, uh, happened with TON, a Telegram open network, where Telegram was about to launch its own cryptocurrency uh, based on quite advanced uh, blockchain implementation. And then what happened? Do you remember? Well, it didn't happen, first of all. Why did it not happen? Uh, well, it was rejected by American officials and some, something like that. Precisely. And why the American officials did regulate this? That was precisely because they viewed those uh, TON tokens as being equity tokens. So not issue to pay for uh, whatever services, but being issued as giving the owners of those TON tokens some kind of uh, equity-like control over the company, which is absolutely nothing wrong by itself, but things like that need to be regulated and pre-approved because Telegram did not seek this approval and didn't receive an approval, an approval from the regulators, then it was supposed to be illegal. And the American regulators stopped uh, this type of, as they viewed, equity uh, coins distribution. Indeed, uh, actually what Telegram uh, was trying to do, uh, it was trying to arrive the funds for subsequent development of uh, Telegram and Tone uh, through this 
preliminary sell of uh, ton tokens. And indeed, the question is, you know, how the Telegram was starting to uh, position it. If that they were issuing utility coins and offering these utility coins as a means of future subsequent payments for the services, which will become available once this uh, network is launched. But uh, the United States regulators are reviewing completely differently. So they said, no, it is not uh, just utility coins uh, being used to pay for utilities. These are equity coins, uh, which give uh, the ownership some kind of, uh, the owner some kind of control ownership, uh, at least partial over the company in exchange for the fundraising uh, actually about $1 billion of dollars was raised uh, by this uh, coin, sale, uh, coin, coin, coin sale, which appeared to be um, illegal. And uh, for that reason, uh, Telegram Open Network development was suspended. Uh, the CEO, as you know, had to return uh, part of the investment to uh, the investors, uh, and then uh, very recent news is that uh, Telegram uh, was still able to compensate for the loss of funding by uh, selling bonds, uh, just normal bonds as uh, financial debt instruments, instead of uh, those equity-like uh, tokens. But that was because it was a high-profile case. In many cases, or in many situations during the ICO, owners of uh, those uh, startup companies, uh, they were able to get past uh, the regulators by selling what was actually equity coins and designed for fundraising, uh, pretending they are utility coins. So for example, from this, uh, point of view, uh, the example we have considered last time, this uh, funny booth coin was also an example, obviously, of uh, utility coins, uh, which was supposed to be backed by concert tickets. That's a perfect example of a utility coin, although it didn't materialize. It does exist, but it has a value zero. Uh, My question. Yes. Uh, have Facebook had the same problem as Telegram with his way Libra? Uh, whether it was a similar problem with Libra, I think yes. To a very, maybe the details were similar, were, were a little bit different, but overall, yes. So, uh, or at least I would say, the United States regulators used exactly the same argument in order to stop uh, both actually coins from existence. Uh, because yes, uh, you can't uh, distribute equity without uh, the approval procedure, without the pre-approval. And uh, this is a very easy argument which regulators could use in order to stop your I saw if they want. Uh, in fact, of course, the concern in both cases was uh, an emergence of a uh, very strong alternative currency, even more so in case of Libra because of a very large uh, Facebook uh, user base, uh, which could, uh, as the regulators view, uh, maybe jeopardize the whole financial system of the United States, something like that. Uh, another interesting example, interesting uh, comparison is, um, let us draw another alternative. So the first one is a utility versus equity. Another one is fungible versus non-fungible coins.
what does it mean? Uh, fungible means especially, well, for both actually, uh, it can happen for utility and for equity coins, uh, those which are completely interchangeable and substitutable uh, for each other. So, for example, if it is a boost coin and uh, this coin allows you to go to a concert, then uh, if you get uh, another coin, then it would be uh, just exactly the same concert ticket. I'm not sure whether, for example, the seat numbers, rows and numbers uh, did exist uh, in those smart contracts. Not sure, probably not. And uh, in that case, the coins are absolutely uh, same. So having two coins, you can just buy two concert tickets. Uh, by themselves, the, con uh, the coins are indistinguishable from each other. If uh, these are equity coins, then the situation is similar. So basically, yes, you hold uh, two coins instead of one. It means that uh, you are allowed to receive two times more dividends, that you have two times more voting rights if uh, they, are they are provided in this case. And uh, overall, you have just two times larger proportion in your ownership in a company. But uh, there is no uh, special difference between uh, these two coins. But that's not always the case. Because uh, of growing application areas of the coins, they could not only and then it becomes interesting. Not only uh, indicate your ownership, for example, of a part of the company, but they can indicate your uh, ownership of some other object as well. So, for example, uh, there could be unique items such as maybe real estate or maybe some collectible art, artifacts, maybe something else. And your possession of the corresponding coin means entitlement uh, to possess uh, the corresponding real world object. So for example, just uh, let's say a house, a real estate. And they are not all interchangeable. They are in fact all different. And in this case, we're talking about non-fungible coins, which means non-substitutable uh, by each other uh, or for each other, simply because uh, each coin has an individual character. Each coin represents an ownership of some kind of particular real life object different, distinguishable from other real life objects. For that reason, actually implementing, what do you think uh, is easier to implement on top of uh, whatever blockchain, Ethereum in particular, fungible or non-fungible coins? Fungible? Fungible are easier to implement. They are easier to implement simply because if they are completely interchangeable with each other, they do not need to indicate any real object they stand for. Whereas non-fungible coins, they have, uh, a, let's say, a personal character. So they must indicate, and there must be a provision made for indication, uh, contain info of particular objects they stand for. And that's why The very first standard ERC20 was created for fungible coins. 
and the vast majority of them are still fungible, whereas non-fungible coins require extensions, and it is supported, for example, in ERC721 and subsequent standards. We, I don't think we'll implement actually non-fungible coins, which uh, in, in you know a lab work, which uh, already tells us that probably ERC721 uh, is not really needed, but we'll make it easier. Uh, I mean, not need for us, uh, you know, implementation. So I'm really going to implement uh, a coin which would act like uh, just a cryptocurrency rather than stand for <clears throat> uh, individual objects. Obviously, creating coins which stand to stand for and indicate ownership of uh, whatever real-life objects is technically possible on top of the Ethereum uh, network, but you really need to, uh, when it is done, to understand the economic means. Uh, the economic meaning of that. So whether it really means anything or uh, it does not. So for example, uh, consider the following economic situation. I implemented a coin on top of uh, Ethereum network, which entitles the owners uh, of that coin to own, uh, for example, particular flats in uh, the town of Indianapolis. So I sell those coins to you, you give me money, but in fact, it doesn't mean that you would be able to get hold of the apartment, right? Because it doesn't belong to me. I just sold coins to you. Can it happen? Absolutely. So uh, those coins which are proxies uh, for particular real life uh, assets, for example, real estate, Technically, they're all the same. And the technical means of introducing those coins is uh, just to make transactions with those, uh, with those assets easier. But <clears throat> whether in reality, you would be able to get hold of a real life object uh, based on your possession of a coin, is completely outside this uh, RC20 or whatever uh, kind of standard. So basically, uh, in order to, how do you think uh, actually it may work? So why, for example, we say that uh, Tether or USDT, which we discussed last time, is still a kind of uh, a cryptocurrency which really stands for real United States dollars. Whereas if I now create a 20 line RC20 compliant uh, Ethereum smart contract, which would grant the owners of uh, the smart contract, for example, property rights to uh, in Napolis uh, apartments, then it wouldn't have any meaning whatsoever. So where is the difference between real coins with economic meaning and coins which are, uh, I will not use derogatory term, but uh, let's say uh, completely, uh, completely junk, uh, no value, uh, no value coins. So wh where is the difference? The difference is that, first of all, the original issuer of these coins must really have uh, access to uh, the corresponding real-life uh, asset. So, for example, uh, the company Ethereum, uh, sorry, uh, the company Tether, uh, when uh, they issue uh, a new USDT, in fact, it is a kind of utility token, new USDT, uh, they do receive uh, from However, uh, they receive the corresponding amount of dollars. Uh, by the way, uh, they by themselves, uh, Tether, 
they only operate with very large amounts of USD and USDT. You cannot uh, just sell to them directly. Uh, you cannot sell your one USD, for example, for USDT, and you cannot cash uh, a single USDT uh, for USD from them. The minimum amount of transaction uh, with the originator, with the Tether company, with the originator of USDT, is what? Do you remember? Have you seen that? Minimum USDT amount. It is sizable. It is 150k. 150k USD. And then uh, the whole operation of, um, I mean, a real economic operation of um, uh, USDT uh, relies upon the fact that, first of all, uh, the company really does have, uh, it does receive and does keep uh, the corresponding amount of USDs. And then eventually, that corresponding amount of USDs can be received from them. Yes, uh, they do it in lots of 150k, but nevertheless, it is possible to eventually receive USD, uh, the corresponding amount of USDs back from them. So, for example, if now you can imagine actually how uh, a crypto exchange would eventually operate. A crypto exchange, sooner or later, having accumulated, uh, for example, they allow people to buy cryptocurrencies for USD, which is typically a two-stage process. So first of all, uh, you exchange your USD for USDT, and uh, then you do whatever cryptocurrency transactions uh, between, let's say, BTC and USDT. Uh, as soon as uh, an exchange had accumulated, uh, let's say, one, uh, a lot of 150k USDs, it can deposit those USDs uh, with Tether and get back uh, the corresponding number of USDT. Or the way around, so if they need to meet their obligations and pay the clients uh, the physical USDs, the fiat USDs, after receiving USDTs, eventually they need to get those USDs from somewhere. From whom? If you accumulated a lot uh, of 150k uh, USDT, you can go to Tether and they would, re uh, release, uh, would release USD back to you. And uh, you will uh, send through the normal banking transactions those USDs to your clients who previously sold cryptocurrencies to you. So uh, then uh, the real economic functioning of uh, this system, uh, it depends on, first of all, uh, the originator of the coins uh, really receiving the corresponding real life assets uh, into their possession. And then obviously, all depends on them being uh, honest and uh, providing their obligations uh, for their obligations and being able really to get eventually the corresponding uh, real life object uh, in the exchange in exchange for a token uh, which it stands for. So the whole idea why we operate with those tokens is simply because it is easy to operate with them in an electronic format. And uh, let's say tokens, non-fungible tokens, which stand for real estate, they are very much similar to uh, the original ledger technologies, I wouldn't say distributed ledger, but the original ledger technologies, paper ledger technologies, which were always present in the real estate market. So what is a ledger? The ledger in the UK and in the US was just uh, a record, a register of ownership to a particular real estate, a particular property. And when the property changes hands, 
then uh, let's say the passport of the ledger of this property uh, remain the same, but a value, uh, uh, just a new record is uh, appended to it, very much like it works in uh, uh, the modern distributed ledger systems, uh, where, as you know, the whole history is preserved, uh, the history of transactions. Uh, same uh, what's happening in those real estate paper ledgers. So, for example, a particular uh, house gets a new owner, then a new record is uh, added uh, to the ledger, to the passport, uh, let me call it that way, uh, of that real estate. Now saying, saying that uh, the previous owner had sold it to a new owner uh, in the presence of, uh, let's say, public notary uh, for that amount, and uh, the ownership right is transferred from a particular date. Uh, only the only difference is that uh, those paper ledgers were not distributed; they were kept just in, in a single copy uh, with the corresponding land register authorities uh, required to keep track of all uh, real estate transactions. So, if anything would happen, and it did happen from time to time, for example, just a fire in an archive, and then the whole records are destroyed then there would be extremely, extremely, extremely difficult to prove your ownership rights. And uh, this is from the real estate ownership point of view, is a total disaster when paper centralized non-distributed ledgers are accidentally destroyed for whatever reason. Obviously, uh, distributed ledger systems uh, in uh, our electronic age, this completely uh, solve this problem through multiple and multiple replication. No matter what happens with a particular node, whether it is destroyed or it is down or it is compromised or whatever happens, the integrity of the whole uh, distributed ledger is uh, supported and maintained by the consensus algorithm. Okay, uh, so having seen that, let us uh, now uh, consider the most important elements of how a coin is designed. So a coin is a smart contract. So basically a smart contract, what do we think is the first and by far the most important functionality coming even before the transactions, which uh, any coin uh, must implement. And that is Minting. a very interesting thing. Yes? Minting coin. I couldn't hear you. What do you say? Production of the coin. Ownership of the coins, right? That's what you say. Yes. So basically, unlike any fiat money, let's say cash, if you implement a coin, you really need to implement a map of balances. So the first thing you need to do is to implement account balances as a map as a map uh, well how do you identify the holder the holder is identified by uh, their corresponding ethereum uh, wallet address because there is already an addressing uh, technology available within Ethereum, then typically you would reuse uh, this technology and uh, use uh, same addressing mechanism uh, to uh, identify uh, the owners. So it is address map to balance. F 
for Ethereum itself. This is what uh, the built-in Ethereum functionality does for you, right? Because Ethereum itself does have a notion of addresses and wallets and does have a notion of transactions between them. And that's for Ethereum itself. For your own uh, coins, it is what you have to implement yourself. And that is uh, the basic, by far, the most important uh, uh, part of functionality. Uh, there is another interesting thing. Uh, we'll come to this very shortly. We'll see that there are two types of transactions uh, allowed uh, typically in the RC20 contract, two types of transactions allowed. One of them is a direct transaction uh, between, uh, actually between those balances, and the other one uh, is um, a fundraising or uh, ICO type uh, transaction, which uh, may use a third party uh, to issue this transaction. And then there is a certain mechanism for allowances, uh, how much a third party can withdraw from a particular account. So uh, we'll come to the allowances uh, very shortly. But for the moment, it is just this map. And associated with this map, uh, one of the principal, and probably the most frequently used methods uh, in uh, an RC20 compliant uh, contract is uh, simply a transfer. So, then. so what does it mean? It means that, um, First of all, it means that the whole data in this map uh, associated with a smart contract, they're stored in, uh, in, in the network. So when uh, a smart contract state, uh, a smart contract state uh, is changed, uh, then uh, it is precisely a transaction between one address, uh, occurs between one address and another, and then uh, uh, we do have uh, an update uh, in this map. Uh, let us make a very short break uh, and we'll continue from that point on, okay? Okay, so in order to uh, perform a transfer, uh, what happens? First of all, a transfer transaction can be initiated. The active uh, entry in this case could only be a real life user. So there is a user here 
with the user ID, right? Which are initiates a transfer to another account. So what does it mean? It means that it invokes a transaction on the smart contract. So that's our smart contract. ERC20 compliant. And obviously when a transaction is uh, with a transfer method is initiated, you already know that uh, uh, each method within your smart contract, it knows the ID of the transaction originator or the transaction originator, all right? So if a transaction occurs, then it is known who actually uh, originated this transaction, which means that transfer knows the user ID here. And it is implemented precisely uh, in this way. So the argument of transfer is the recipient ID, right? This recipient ID. And then the implementation is obviously extremely uh, simple. So this map, uh, let's say this map is, is balances. Then uh, it is implemented as balances of the originator user ID and, and, and obviously the second argument is amount, all right? Uh, balances of the originator user ID. Obviously after uh, the check that you can uh, do that, uh, for example, without going negative, is uh, decremented. And the balances of the recipient user ID is incremented with that amount. And um, here is how one of the very first mishaps did occur in Ethereum back in 2016. Uh, a smart contract was implemented in a way opposite. So first incrementing recipient and then de decrementing uh, the originator uh, account and in between there was an apparently so that was the first action that was the second one in between there was an apparently uh, har harmless computation but in fact it could trigger a stack overflow within the ethereum virtual machine and triggering a stack overflow between uh, increment and decrement, you could, you know, transfer funds to someone without decrementing yourself. So that was one of the first vulnerabilities uh, due to uh, limitations and insecurity of the runtime environment in the Ethereum virtual machine encountered. So that's how uh, it happened. So this is a very simple uh, transaction. Uh, another one is uh, a so-called transfer from which means that uh, this transaction has three, uh, three arguments effectively and two of them are addresses. So basically from ID to ID or recipient ID and amount. And the question is, uh, why do you need it? If you subtract your own account, then everything is very simple. So you don't need it. You simply uh, transfer with the recipient ID. But transfer from is useful in order to be able to uh, subtract funds from someone else. So the user ID who originates uh, this transaction, so basically there is a user ID which invokes receive uh, transfer from, but this user ID, this user ID doesn't need to be equal to either from ID 
or recipient ID. It could be a completely uh, completely uh, third party unrelated to our idol them account, which might actually be useful. And this typically happens uh, to support uh, ICO type of functionality. Obviously, it wouldn't be very nice if a completely unrelated user can subtract funds from any other account uh, within your smart contract and transfer those funds to any other ID. I think it's not nice, all right? Sometimes it is useful, but there must be limits to that. So in order to make this functionality controllable, you need, first of all, a data structure which controls this process. And this data structure, is it is called the allowances map. So what is this map? Uh, it is a map uh, which uh, um, tells you uh, and it is a part of your smart contract uh, from whom you are allowed to subtract uh, the corresponding amount and uh, to whom uh, you are allowed to uh, uh, to add it. So basically it is a double, uh, you can view it either a nested map or uh, uh, just for simplicity we can say uh, it is a pair being key map to the amount, maximum amount which is allowed. So from this ID you can get the maximum uh, specified or uh, from this ID being sent to in order to uh, prevent uh, let's say all funds being transferred from uh, one ID to another you are allowed only that amount of uh, your coins uh, to be uh, transferred. This is typically to support an ICO type of workflow which happens uh, like this. we may actually implement something like this in our coin as well. Do we have a name for our coin, by the way, to, to, to implement? Have you got with the name already? Not yet? Let us do some proposals and voting in Telegram. How it would look, look like. So typically, uh, first of all, uh, there is a certain company and uh, the company uh, creates, so for example, there is some company limited and uh, this some company limited created a coin. Some coin, some coin. A coin is this ERC20 uh, compliant contract. So what happened then? Initially, when the coin is created, okay, we have incorporated our company and we are now free to create any number of coins, all right? So what do we do normally? So here is the CEO. It's me. Okay, that's the CEO. Uh, initially, when we create the coins, how would our ownership map look like? This account balances. What, the, what would they originally be? All coins would belong to the CEO initially. So, balances. would look like 
Garcia. 10 to 15 coins. Okay. But now we want to hire developers for our company. We really need money. And you know what? Although I have created, okay, the show is me. Although I have created 10 to the power 15 coins. Who would go to work for my company as a developer if I pay you with those coins? I don't think that there are many volunteers to do that. The developers who are going to work for the company probably need to work for money rather than for my coins, right? So what do we need? We need to raise real money. So for that reason, so that's contract, uh, that's the smart contract number one. For that reason, we create a smart contract number two, which would act as an intermediary between this CC coin, as I call it, and real money. So this would be our ICO. That's smart contract two, which is ICO contract. So what would this ICO contract need to do? It would need to receive real money. Well, not so real money. To receive Ethereum, which in this case is real money. An ICO contract cannot receive uh, Bitcoins, let alone it cannot receive dollars. It can, although, receive... Uh, it can receive... Ethereum, or maybe it can receive some other cryptocurrencies being implemented on top of Ethereum. So, by the way, it's an interesting question actually, whether it would be easy to implement or possible to implement a smart contract which directly receives USDT rather than Ethereum. Let's think about that. But for the moment, it is uh, the most straightforward thing to implement a contract which receives Ethereum. So here there is a party which is called investor, also called venture capitalist. Okay. So this venture capitalist sends Ethereum and yes, here we use precisely the mechanism which allows a smart contract to receive real Ethereum to its address. And he wants to get some of our CC coins in exchange for this Ethereum. At which rate we will decide how many coins we are going to give him. So then the transaction sequence is the following. So uh, yet they sent Ethereum and our ICO contract needs to subtract uh, our CC coins from the CO account. And so this is a Mr. VC, okay? And, and this is the CO. For the moment, everything belongs to the CO. So we need to subtract the coins from uh, the VC account and increment, uh, create a second uh, entry in our map and increment uh, the value of uh, the corresponding uh, VC entry. The coin itself cannot do it. Why? because the coin is a coin and it doesn't know that uh, any Ethereum is being sent to uh, this account. It is typically a much better idea to have the coin itself and an entity which operates with the coin uh, to be implemented as two completely separate 
contract. So what SC2 needs to do? On receiving Ethereum, and uh, you may think it is the first step, but it is not the first. Okay, suppose that it is the first step. In fact, there will be a zero step prior to that. So a transaction occurred of Ethereum to SC2. And now as step number two, this ICO contract needs to somehow update this map, but the map belongs to another contract. So now it needs to modify it, modify balances, such that now CO is decremented. So here N Ethereum uh, and Ethers are sent. CO account is, suppose that there is an exchange rate R, which is a value of our coin, CC coin, CC coin over Ethereum. N Ethereum are sent. So if the R is the exchange rate, uh, exchange rate of C coin over Ethereum, then uh, what is the amount uh, the CO account is decremented? On receipt of N Ethereum, obviously N times our exchange rate. And the VC account is incremented by the same amount. But how? Now the ICO contract needs another balances to be modified. And here precisely where this transaction, which has both actually from ID and recipient ID, uh, this transaction, which is a transfer from, can be carried out. So in order to do this, this transaction is transfer from. The originator of this transaction is the address of this smart contract. Uh, with from being CO, recipient being VC, and the amount being obviously NR. But this is not uncontrollable. It is not possible. What if now uh, someone would try to revert this transaction and subtract the money back from the VC, uh, I mean, uh, the coins, and give the coins back to, uh, uh, back to the CEO? We need to prevent this. And in order to prevent this, at the very zero step, we need to carry out an authorization call, which is called a proof. Uh, in the simplest form, a proof subtraction from uh, the CO account for some kind of maximum number of coins. And then, uh, once it is approved, the corresponding approval or authorization or uh, call it anyway map uh, will be updated. The allowances map will be updated and our transfer from method looks up the allowances map. to verify the transaction. Maybe this map would also contain limits depending on the destination, which is also quite possible. So overall picture is like that. 
uh, as you can see, RC20 is not a very sophisticated functionality, yet it is sufficient uh, in many cases to create non-fungible uh, coins and use those coins uh, in our transactions. That's what we are starting to implement. As you can see, any naive implementation of this functionality may be insecure. You need to, in fact, take into account lots of uh, possible potential error conditions uh, about, let's say, negative values, underflows, overflows, surround errors, which may occur here. Uh, potential runtime issues like uh, uh, stack overflow, which I mentioned, uh, things like uh, uh, in more uh, complex cases, what happens if uh, there is a transitive call uh, from one smart contract to another. So basically that's why uh, the whole profession of smart contract auditing uh, was created uh, in order to provide security checks uh, to uh, smart contracts representing, representing the coins. Uh, in the inner chain, in our fourth generation distributed ledger system, all those manual checks, uh, auditing, uh, testing, and so on, is replaced with uh, formal verification of our smart contracts and a formal verification of our execution environment. But overall, there is nothing more mysterious about RC20 uh, than uh, what we have discussed. There are some uh, auxiliary methods uh, which allow you, for example, to uh, view the balance, uh, uh, in particular, to see the total supply of the coins you know, it's, 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 it's very nice. What if we, for example, instead of, uh, yes, we'll, we'll receive Ethereum, but uh, at the same time, the coins are created by us, so we can uh, increment our own balance. Why not? If we provide the corresponding API method in, uh, in our smart contract, and we'll have an unlimited supply of our own coins, we receive Ethereum and we increment our coin uh, balance a nice thing, isn't it? And that is a fundamental difference, by the way, between uh, those smart uh, contracts and uh, Ethereum itself. Because Ethereum itself uh, is protected from double spending only by, well, is protected from double spending by uh, the security mechanisms embedded in the Ethereum uh, blockchain itself which is currently proof of work and later on it is going to be a proof of stake uh, in Ethereum 2.0. Whereas if you create your own coin uh, implemented as uh, your own smart contract, you can create whatever backdoors which allow you to replenish whatever balances and create double, triple, one million time spendings of your coins. Uh, this is completely, completely up to you. Of course, uh, the bytecode of your smart contract is deployed in the blockchain. It is visible to everyone. It is uh, subject to scrutiny and analysis and review uh, by any party. So obviously uh, what your smart, coin is, uh, smart contract is doing will immediately become clear to everyone, although I'm not sure if you if you try hard enough to uh, cover up your intentions, uh, then maybe uh, you can create some uh, kind of unethical and uh, misbehaving uh, smart contract which uh, has some kind of transactional backdoors. Why not? So that's probably all which I wanted to uh, talk today. I will not keep you for a long time on Friday evening. And uh, next week, 
we will complete our coin implementation and uh, do sample transactions with them, uh, with our coins, and then we will see how to build a distributed exchange. Maybe we will build, first of all, really uh, an ICO type of functionality first, which would make use of transfer from, and uh, later on uh, build a distributed exchange, which would allow some kind of competitive trading of our newly created coins for Ethereum. But for the moment, we are done. If any questions, please let me know. All fine? Okay, thank you then, and see you next Tuesday. Thanks, bye. Thank you.